Hi, good afternoon. I'm Julia Bryan Wilson. I am uh, the Doris and Clarence Mallow Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art at UC Berkeley and also the Director of the Arts Research Center, which is hosting this event tonight. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsors, which include the Department of Art Practice, the Center for the Study of Sexual Cultures, and the Center for the Study of Race and Gender. I also want to acknowledge that this event and every event that ha takes place on the UC Berkeley campus happens on the unceded territory of the Ohlone peoples and to pay respectful tribute to this land as their ancestral home. Um, I have a few announcements to make before I introduce our um, esteemed guest uh, tonight, one of which is that on November 8th, which is a Friday from 4 to 6, the curator Mark Godfrey uh, will be in conversation with um, Kenyatta Hinkle, who's an art practice professor here at Berkeley, talking about the show Soul of a Nation, which opens, I think, that next day um, at the Legion of Honor. So um, that will be at the David Brower Center, close to BART, from 4 to 6. I also want to say that um, the Arts Research Center is starting an initiative called Poetry in the Senses. There's cards that look like this that tell you a little bit about it. Um, there's a fellowship program that will begin in January for two Berkeley professors, two Berkeley grad students, two Berkeley undergrads, and two local poets um, to convene over the course of the year um, and think the, through together the theme of the year, um, which is emergency. So if you're someone who um, has a poetic frame of mind you don't, um, or wants to think about poetry in conversation um, with a really interestingly horizontal group of people, that is to say kind of, you know, people from um, not just from campus but also from the community, and think about um, especially poetry in times of crisis it might be a good opportunity for you. I think that was all my... Oh, yes, and I also want to give a very heartfelt thanks to um, my staff at the Arts Research Center, Lauren Pearson and Lori McPhee, and also to the people at ETS tonight for their um, technical assistance. Thank you. So we're here, of course, to hear from the world-renowned painter Julie Muratu. Julie, who lives and works in New York City, was born in Ethiopia in 1970. Her bachelor's degree is from Kalamazoo College, and her master's of fine arts, um, which she received with honors, is from the Rhode Island School of Design. She's the recipient of many awards, including the American Art Award, granted by the Whitney Museum, and a MacArthur Genius Award, both from 2005. She's also received the Berlin Prize and the US Department of State Medal of Arts Award uh, in 2015. Her work is currently on view um, at the Venice Biennial, and her curatorial selections are on display at the Guggenheim as part of their artistic license show um, now on view. And I want to also say that Paul Chan, another one of the artists whose work is, who has gone deep into the Guggenheim collection and curated a, a selection, um, will be the UNA lecturer next week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, so just look out for that. It's especially nice to have Julie back in the Bay Area because, as most of you know, in 2017, SFMOMA unveiled her major commission of site-specific works, um, which are, in my opinion, a clear highlight of their new building. She is visiting us from LA, where she's in the midst of installing her mid-career retrospective, which opens in about a week, I think the press preview is next Wednesday, at LACMA, and we'll travel to the Whitney, and she came up specifically to have this conversation, so we are truly very grateful in the midst of this really busy time. So please join me in welcoming Julie. Right. Thank you. Thank you for all coming out on such a beautiful night. Can everyone it's hear amazing. us? amazing. Can you hear? I want to quickly say first, oh, because things have started. I forgot to push play. That what we're looking at is a selection of images that Julie has pulled together that range from her own work to reference images, historical paintings, things that inspire her, news images that she works from. And it's a really eclectic mix, and they're not captioned. So um, in a way, we're just going to let those sort of flow over on top of this conversation. And we might refer to some of them, but we might not. And the first image that you saw was a David Hammond's piece, Pray for America, from 1990. 1969, and Julie thought that would be an interesting place to kick off the conversation as a as an artist that she's long been kind of um, in conceptual dialogue with. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to start by asking you because here you are in the midst of installing. How does it? How are you approaching the idea of the mid-career retrospective, both maybe artistically, but also emotionally, psychologically? You know, this kind of stock taking. <laughs> It's the most, I think, um, Helen Molesworth and I were in the studio the other day talking. She used to be a curator at MoCA in Los Angeles, and she brought, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? She brought the 
the Carrie James Marshall show. She was one of the big curators of the retrospective that started at the Met Metropolitan and then traveled through. And she'd been working with him for a long time. But when we talked about like installing this, she said, I don't think there's another moment when in, in other careers that you're asked to kind of take stock of what you've done. And I think maybe that happens when you put together the anthology of poetry, but a lot of times even a publisher does that mm -hmm. when you're not, no longer alive. Or so this this comes from that tradition, and I actually think it's not the right form for a lot of artists. I think it works for painters because that's a, a, in a sense a traditional medium, mm -hmm. media, and it works in this way that um, we have an understanding of trying to make sense of things. But it also really, in a very intense way, limits what that what the possibilities are and how painting evolves, how thinking evolves, how creative thought moves, and so it's super complicated and. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really, I feel like it's an incredible moment. It, if it happens once in a lifetime, it's an incredible moment. If it happens more than once, it's like a really rare thing. But I think that it's, it's a very like a really complicated and uncanny thing mm -hmm. to try to take stock of your work that you've done over a life and make a story out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it works in many ways contradictory to the way the creative practice and mm -hmm. creative process works. Well, do you, are you enjoying that yes. then? No, I mean, but tell, I am. Tell, me, tell me, how's it going? I wanted to hear about the emotional <laughs> so, part. So it's difficult. It's complicated. It's, no, it is. But you're in the middle of it. So narrate, narrate the complications. So, I mean, emotionally, it's like this amazing thing because you put, I've worked on this work since I was, in, um, I don't know, very young. And I have work in the show that starts from graduate school when I was in school, just 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 coming into the language that I started to invent. And I think what what when you do like I've done shows, I've done participated in big group shows like the Venice Biennale now or the Documenta in 2012 or the Whitney Biennial in 2004. And you make, you know, that's a huge, there's a lot of pressure around a, an exhibition like that and you put this, you put a lot of work and thought into what you're into a project. And then it's in this context and dialogue, sometimes in, in a conversation that really makes sense and other times in a really complicated relationship. But a lot of times for painting, it puts painting, because it's a flat image, almost as a background. Mm -hmm. Like a video mm -hmm. or a performance piece or sculpture takes space in a different way mm -hmm. than painting does. And this is one of the challenges of painting and of it. And so a lot of times in those contexts, it almost feels like the work it, it really fights to have a space. Mm -hmm. And in this context, there was this beautiful moment where I realized that the, these paintings, like they support each other in this mm -hmm. co context. So when you're putting the show, to, when the, installing the show, and you, they, as they start getting, putting, getting, you know, going up on the wall, the, and it's a very slow process with me because we have to restretch a lot of the very big paintings. There's this, you start seeing them hold each other, like support mm -hmm. each other, and there's this very intense they, that some came were came into the world with before others and others be, existed when others didn't and you know so there's yeah. this really weird relationship between them also but is it a, and it's a relationship that you feel like is just now emerging one that wasn't necessarily evident to you until this hang yeah yeah and they just they kind of they kind of conceptually or like mm -hmm. they, they could support each other in a very like or like erratic way, like mm. not in a. In, it's not in a sense that we understand. Like it's not how a sibling props another sibling. It's more. It works differently than that. Mm. It's this other. It's this other sensibility in that sense. Well, let me read you something from the press release that I want to talk to you about. So this is a, a little blurb about the LACMA show. It covers over two decades of her examination of history, colonialism, capitalism, geopolitics, war, global uprising, diaspora, and displacement. Those are big words. Through the artistic strategies of abstraction, architecture, landscape, movement, and most recently, figuration. So, I mean, I guess, it's really interesting to hear you talk about your work, your paintings in the context of like a Venice or a Documenta as um, sometimes re because of its medium receding to the background. But all of those words are so, I mean, they're always ever present, I guess, but they feel very present in fall of 2019. And so to see your work kind of take center stage once again, I mean, it just feels like your painting is really at the, f is, um, 
it's, I think there, it's been foregrounded. The urgencies that you have long been grappling with you know, right. feel kind of sharper than ever. So it's, uh, I think you mentioned the kind of uncanny feeling of the retrospective for you, but I think there's also, it feels a little uncanny in its timing happening right now. Well, it's like, it's, it's, these are like, these are all, they've, these have always been very intense. They, I mean, you could, they, you could add many more words to that list that inform and, and, impact and affect how any of us do negotiate the worlds around us and how we build and make and think about whatever we're involved in. And yet at this moment, I think especially with the way that we are dealing with media and social media and as, as a component of that, but just in general, how we're dealing with the way information is spreading and how we listen to information, read information and process information, we have this we, images and words and concepts and phrases are weaponized in a different way. So we're at this moment where you have this very different kind of um, kind of battle between these things. But I think like all of them like go back to this this place where you're kind of extracting these concepts from their from a, from whatever historical past or per place, and you're trying to then process them and get them into a possible new future. So they can be like, a pro like if you can posit them as something else, there's a way to think or, and find a break inside of this. Uh, You're talking about some of your source images. Or yeah, just, just any of, of these of words, these this concept, right. okay. like this idea of like being able to use these sources that inform and impact how, like, so basically as an artist, you're, I'm negotiating how, who I am in this world mm -hmm. and then how, what I try to invent and make is about a relate is 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 in a way a negotiation of that, but it's a way of then trying to invent some other thing, some mm -hmm. other futurity in that. Well, maybe we can um, just to clarify or to explain, expand, yeah. you know, um, explicate a little bit more of your process for these very recent works, kind of since 2017, yeah. which are drawing images from social media, um, news images of really difficult. Migration detention centers, the election of Jair Bolsonaro, forest fires, yeah. uh, riots, uprisings, clashes, the inauguration of Trump, et cetera, et cetera. And that those become this kind of underpainting, you know, that ghosts the final image but is by no means legible right. in what you do on top of it. And I guess I have a, I guess, so that's just to explain a little bit of what we're looking at here. This is, you know, images um, that are familiar to probably to most of us. So I guess one question I have for you is, you know, how much are you thinking about the hope of the possible future or the invention of the new language when you're grappling with some of these really difficult images and you are abstracting them, you know, far away from their initial legibility? I really rarely think about hope outside okay. of like Barack Obama who I adore, um, but I really don't think, uh -huh. like, in terms of, like, that that word doesn't come up, but I do think about, um, I'm not pessimistic as, as, at the same time, mm -hmm. and I think that, I think that actually anyone who's had to negotiate um, race, culture, uh, in, like idea, your place in, in, and actually this work, this goes for anybody having to negotiate their identity within a context that has prescriptive ideas of who you are, and that for anybody in this country especially, but anywhere in the world, we mm -hmm. we are dealing with these ideations around who you, who you are, and I think that we're constantly negotiating that space and and how and how there's many preconceptions or many kind of preconditions of what the, of, of what that reads as or what the possibilities are and meanwhile there's like a, like a, mil, a z that's not the individual experience the individual experience is really something that can't be individuated in that way it's a really abstract complicated contradictory negotiation constantly mm -hmm. of who you are and and how you are and so i think like uh, you know, I use many many at the beginning it was a mark it was a mark on a piece of paper to def to try and negotiate what what individual agency could be and how it could meet, how it could operate and try to think about that metaphorically, mm -hmm. and then it became negotiating that within architectural and social space and thinking about the history of the built environment as a thinking around space and time and and then it really like that became something where I became really knowledgeable of that and that wasn't so interesting in the same way mm -hmm. or felt so. And I became much more interested in the kind of abstract possibilities that are embedded inside of a lot of these images that inform me and inform the social context I'm living in. But I became interested in the blur mm -hmm. and in the, in the kind of compressed, 
dis, d language inside of those. And for me, like, I think part of that is, like, how do you use me? How, like, how am I thinking differently in a possible different future with this media? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the me, like, I used to cut the paper, the images out of the newspaper when, uh, when the newspaper was black and white. And then when the newspaper became these color images that changed, and then it all became something that you could get on your phone or on the, and so media has changed so rapidly mm -hmm. from when I started working that the way that I've processed it and think about it and, get, and negotiate that has really shifted. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, like I feel like I go, the, the reason that I blur a lot of the photographs now, like I take a photograph of say an event, um, like these, the California, the wildfires from here in 2018, just north of here. And I took one image and I, that image, I blurred it and that became a point of departure for this painting. Mm -hmm. But my interest in the blur is only to absolutely, is to kind of capture the light, the time, the, Im the color, this, this one kind of DNA of that moment and that image as one an element of this double helix that makes up the, the mm -hmm. complex kind of image that becomes the painting, which is not an image that's readable or something that you can decipher in a way, mm -hmm. but is this image that is visceral and that it shifts how you then um, kind of what you see in that. And it, so it's really, it has all these other layers in mm -hmm. that, and that layer is this experiential layer that hopefully offers something else. Right, yeah, and that's something... I, I don't mean to be speaking so abstractly, but I think it's abstract in, it's in an essence. Yeah, I mean, so your answer, which was um, dense and rich, makes me think of a lot of different things, including Glissant's idea of the right to opacity, right. you know, and the strategic use of the blur. It makes me think of um, your indebtedness, often in, that often comes out in your titles, to the black radical aesthetic traditions of jazz and improvisation. Right. Um, but I also, I am curious, so we can talk about both of those things, maybe, but I also am really curious curious about like when you're in the space of the studio, mm -hmm. like you're literally engaged in the act of mark making, you have to make decisions about where go, what goes where, what color to choose, et cetera, et cetera. Are you thinking about like a word like geopolitics? No. You know? No. I'm in the studio and I'm listening to something. Mm -hmm. I listen to all kinds of things, whether it's uh, news, podcasts, music, uh, audiobook, um, what it, a film like it really depends and mm -hmm. i and that and a big part of that process is is um working intuitively so and i think of intuition it's a it's a really important sense in creative practice and for any creative practice and it's so in a way it's about speaking before you think it's about trying to process mm -hmm. and make something without the thought process that informs that and then there's a process of kind of gen then trying to dig through that and understand that further so i think that um you know so for me the process of the, the studio my first step in the studio is really to get as lost as i can mm -hmm. from myself this kind of mm -hmm. disembodied way of making but it's not as if the hand is working like today on one thing and then, in the, you know, they, 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 it's in a very informed, intuitive way of making. And so the idea is that that process kind of uh, shocks and alerts me. Like mm -hmm. it, it teaches me in, otherwise it's like, and there are days that that happens and days that it doesn't. And every day actually leads, usually I work and, and you know, you're spinning wheels a lot. Like mm -hmm. so where the invention happens is where there's a step. Mm -hmm. Agnes Martin talked about that really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that you, you don't see those kind of evident steps so clearly in her, in mm -hmm. her pieces because it's a grid and then the grid maybe breaks a bit. Yeah, and then, tiny wobble. Yeah, yeah. a little. And, but it was always, I mean, she would make work and if she wouldn't show it or put it out there if she didn't feel like it had that step. Right. This other kind of invention to herself. Yeah. To this kind of self-realization in an understanding of something. And, I, and that's, I think... That that's like the driving force, maybe, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the process. I mean, it wasn't. I, I mean, obviously, your work is about geopolitics. I just was wondering, no, at no, the, and, you sure. know, in the moment, you know, in the moment of kind of aesthetic decision making, how? And but I don't. I even think when you think of geopolitics, I don't think I think that's such an enormous concept. Yeah. That it's more like, to me, like something will happen, and I won't even be so conscious how intensely that story I listened to or whatever just happened. How you know, and something else that you know, something I ate or whatever. I listened to a song or what, and the, these things start to happen. But you like, it's it's as if there's this kind of you know, like with a Ouija board, how you like mm -hmm. things start. There's this way of like putting information together, and there's really this space where 
there are all these symbols in history and these words and this past and this kind of knowledge then that's about mining that, like really mining that, only to like, like something else comes together that mm -hmm. you're kind of, you kind of teach yourself in this, mm -hmm. through this process of really letting go. And to me that that, that becomes this image or in, invention that I'm really interested in. Like what is possible in abstraction? What is mm -hmm. possible in making a painting right now? Why be involved in that? Why do I go to the studio every day mm -hmm. to, to, to be engaged in this kind of mm -hmm. practice? It's not only to put a painting on the wall, but mm -hmm. it's, I mean, why do I travel to whatever place to see one painting and, and I spend two hours in front of it? Like where does, the, where, where is that dialogue coming from? Mm -hmm. And how how complicated and contradictory and fucked up is that dialogue? Because it is. It's a it's a it's a it's it's a privilege and it's an intense, but it's an intense necessity too, mm -hmm. socially. Well, one of the things you said, to, one of the things you um, have said to me in the past, uh, the past of about twenty minutes ago, was <laughs> we should talk about the fact that there's a lot of painting right now. It's like a moment <laughs> where there's a lot of painting. Um, and so maybe, and we're stuck on this. Uh, this is pause. Oh, it's pause. But it's a good moment actually to maybe talk about. Um, your, the Guggenheim selection um, that you culled from going deep into their collection um, and how you did make a statement, you know, you're the kind of your curatorial statement was actually about the possibilities of abstraction in a time of um, great upheaval and you right. were periodizing that around World War II. Um, and then we have a bunch, there's a lot of kind of really canonical images, some of them painting, some of them not, you know, where artists are really grappling with world histories in paint and in other right. materials. So um, I'd love to hear you talk about how that Guggenheim Should process, I yeah, I mean, just to, you know, how okay. you were thinking. So the Guggenheim is a very complicated place because it has this beautiful building. It's, in, it's iconic and it's important and it's one, perfect in so many ways. And yet it's filled with massive problem, problematic history. It's, it's embedded in there and it, it's, an, it's this, and its collection really highlights that. It hardly mm -hmm. has, from before 1980, any artists of color, mm -hmm. like from, uh, from the world. And the few artists that it does have, um, I mean, I think the artists of African descent are even more minute, but, it, but, it, but there's a few. And so at the beginning, my intention was like, I, I love going to that museum. I've loved it from when I first moved to New York. I've always loved it from when I, was, when I would visit New York when I was young. And it informed me immensely. Like um, a, a lot of the um, type of abstraction that they were showing really, like what built the collection around originally informed me. And, so, but I didn't want to, I wanted to look at everything else that they had. And I went through the entire archive like four times to actually try and find work. And then I went to see all the work at, at, in the various storage holdings. And a lot of that work that I thought could be interesting in images were really, you look at them at postage size and they're really not. They're, re mm -hmm. they're a lot of bad work. And there's tons of work in storage. That's the other thing that mm -hmm. is, in, is, is shocking as someone who's making because you just realize like it's just going to get. <laughs> <laughs> put away and and that's a n kind of another challenge for the future of museums I think in, mm -hmm. in the big picture but sharing that somehow but I think that what, what, what I was interested in then is what images when I was going through the stacks because these images weren't working and trying to like retell the story from a different perspective that would have been a blank ramp and I didn't want to do that mm -hmm. um, but so what I ended up trying to do then is what works in this are, are like, why, why, what, do I, what am I mostly responding to and why? And so one of the first ones was the big bacon triptych. I was um, stunned by your selection of bacon. Francis Bacon. For the, and, yeah. and that really pulled me. And my youngest son, when I took them to the museum, he was like, you chose that? <laughs> yeah. And he gave me the most disgusting face. He was horrified by that selection. That and the Gustin. He's like, why would like, those two so, things he hated? We, we need to, let's linger on those. I want to hear about that. Well, it's the only Gustin that they have, and it's not, I mean, it's... He was, well, but he was disgusted by, so what was the, where was the disgust just, coming from? He just from? couldn't understand why you would choose a, a, this thing of these trees and a target, like, uh -huh, that uh -huh. was for him. But for the, for the bacon, he was disgusted in the image. I mean, he couldn't look at it. He yeah, walked away. It's a difficult. It's a really difficult. But to me, like, my interest, and I'm a huge, I'm really interested in bacon, was the kind of... The, the, what, what is happening to the disembodied kind of fractured mm -hmm. being and this, 
and you know, there's an image here of Picasso, Picasso, Picasso's Guernica, but you don't have like that. That that became this kind of very. They were working not that far mm -hmm. apart from each other in time, and there's this engagement with like whether subliminally or not. There was this engagement with the colonial kind of dis, like internal colonial mm -hmm. kind of problematics of being that and being Francis Bacon. And to me, what happens in the in the subconscious and what happens in what he's trying to negotiate in terms of not just the subconscious, but in terms of the kind of the aspects of the the fig the figure and yeah, what, I mean, super bodily, bodily again, you know. and broken, yeah, and 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 you know, c c carved apart mm -hmm. and dismantled, mm -hmm. and in a way, it was this and very queer, queer and, very... and this very social activist kind of project in that, mm -hmm. and it was. It, he's a painter that kind that really looked at his, his himself as a colonial and colonial subject himself mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. and I was really interested in that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, Bacon moves me all the time. Uh -huh. Like I'm super interested in the paintings of Velasquez, and he painted and mm -hmm. repainted and looked at those paintings in, in great detail, um, and the structure of those paintings. And there's a certain kind of um, visceral kind of experience that happens where you understand time differently that happens in front of a bacon. So for me, I've, been, I've looked at those paintings a long time. And so, but then I was like, how do I build a narrative around these, what I'm interested right. in here? And you had David Hammond, what, a very recent acquisition yeah. by Hammonds. Yeah, a recent acquisition. Thank God they got yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> we pushed for some others. Uh, and the Senga Nagudis they got. The Nagudis, so those were yeah. important. Um, but I, I think that these like social action, like I think we like go back to like re like rethink this history. How what does this history mean in terms of the way that I'm thinking about mm -hmm. that history? And if I think of one of the most important modern moments being the decolonization of two thirds of the world or two more than two thirds of the world, then that moment and how artists were thinking, responding, mimicking, mm -hmm. copying, participating within that. And how little that's been talked about, it was like essential to the way that I started to think about what I was interested in. I know, it's fascinating to me to put Bacon at the center of that. You know, it's just counterintuitive, I guess. Why, why? Which was so because you're an art historian. Yeah, so I, I mean, mean, there that, hasn't been a really great... It's like that, not that Ouija board thing going on with Well, you. yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I actually did want to ask you about if, you know, your relationship to maybe art criticism, art theory, art history. Like, are, do you read? Are you someone who... Read, well, do you read your own reviews? Do you read? No, like, what? I do. I do. I do. I, mean, I do. <laughs> I like reading fiction a lot more. But I mean, I who doesn't? I mean, but no, know. I mean, yes, yes. Uh huh. But I. But for me, the way that I approach this was really about how how I approach more like how I make in terms of the selections that I put Certainly. together. Certainly, yeah. I mean, it was. I, th I wasn't. I, I thought it wasn't. It was I was. Most... I couldn't approach it wearing a different hat because that's not who I am. Yeah. I'm, and there are artists who write and who are involved with criticism in a really different way. Mm -hmm. And while I do read that, and usually what I read is mo what I'm most interested in and what's informing how I'm thinking around making. So I'll read Fred Moten mm -hmm. or Kojo Eshin in a way, when, when, you know, in a mm -hmm. moment then, or you. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, <laughs> but there's, this is, this is a very different kind of informative, like I'm looking for language usually for an experience that I'm, Engaged in, mm -hmm. and 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 that's different for when I was approached this putting together this work. Right, right. I mean, I think Bacon. What one of the things that is really striking about Bacon is precisely the attention to, you know, this flayed body and to this masculinity in crisis. I think well, to that, me that for sure. and and the Hammond's piece, which yeah. is the uh, another version of. The, the the another image like to me it's about how do you d negotiate these images mm -hmm. and it's his body mm -hmm. that is at the same time this flayed body mm -hmm. it usually always becomes a different type of symbol but then he also he has his hands over his eyes but if you look at that image closely a third eye appears mm -hmm. so there are these two senses of knowing mm. that also happens with the other Hammonds that's in the piece that has the puzzle pieces and it's his mouth and he's kind of, it's his mouth and his chest. And that becomes almost like this mask image. But when you look at it closely again, the mouth becomes a third eye. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, they're really amazingly powerful works. Mm -hmm. Every day, like I live with that other hand, like I know, we, oh, that's oh. mine. And um, you mean I you, go to, it's in your house. Like, yeah, yeah. And I go to, the, I, I look at that and I go to the studio every day thinking, if I could do, like, that's my, like this marker for me about mm -hmm. how much reverberation an actual piece of paper or mark on a piece of paper or like an actual art object can have. And that's like, I think, what 
this endeavor is about. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Well, let me since you don't read reviews very often, I no, will tell I, you. Well, no, I will say though, <laughs> because I, it brings us to this question of abstraction versus abstracting. Some more water. Yeah, yeah, which I think is uh, important for your work and also for Bacon and Hammond. I mean, for all these people that are touchstones for you, which is that it was not a. Um, and you didn't have anything to do with this, so I can tell you that the um, installation in Venice of your work. Um, of course, people love your work, but there were a lot of questions about the choice of putting your work alongside someone like Henry Taylor, who is a, a representational painter, right. also uh, African-American painter, working with kind of questions of black portraiture. And they were hung side by side in a, bit, a room that had other things going with George on. George Kondo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there are other things going on, but people <laughs> were sort of like, what is this room all about? supposed to be about? Just like painting, here it is. Um, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about that, about that constellation, because to me, it raised really interesting questions about, you know, all the many directions that kind of like black painting is taken right taking in this moment. Yeah, I, found, I think people found that really difficult. Like the whole Ralph's installation of the yes, entire Biennale. They did. Yeah, um, it was, because it was mostly when you usually have like in Venice, in, and I've only been to I don't know five Biennale installations. They they're usually each artist has a zone, a room, a space. So in this installation, Ralph Rogoff basically took all the artists and mixed it up. It was an, an enormous group show. So you had different rooms where some artists, like you'd have a, a painter like Nicole Eisenman on one wall and you'd have a sculpture by whoever else, I can't recall right this now, and then you had somebody else on the other wall. And so you had these kind of dialogues between artists in these zones. And in our room, he wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to put me on one wall, George Kondo on another wall, and Henry Taylor, and then Nary Bagramian, mm -hmm. and then, who was the sculptor? Jimmy Durham in right, the same Jimmy room. Durham. And my, I proposed to all the artists, if you're gonna put us in the same space, like, let's hang this like an intentionally group show. Like, mm -hmm. let's put this work in conversation with one another, which problematizes it even further. So, for me, it was, it, it, that was really difficult for a lot of people. Like they, 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 they felt like it was undermining of each other's work mm -hmm. to have this. But if you're going to put us in the same space, it's not an art fair where you're going to put one yeah. thing on one wall and one thing on. And, it's, and, and I think that there's this moment of the, we're living in the, this really uncertain moment where there's so much that people can't have, they don't have the language for, to understand socially, politically, aesthetically, that... That to me, that's really interesting, that it became this space where that same kind of blurring and complication and contradictions took place in the installation. I was like excited by that, mm -hmm. if you're going to do this. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel that Henry Taylor's paintings were a challenge to how one could interact or see my paintings. Mm -hmm. In fact, I thought there were interesting kind of thing, dynamics that would occur. I between, thought so too. I thought, it like, was really, I thought it was a really successful room. Yeah, to I did too. Honest. And I felt like Neri Bagramian's sculptures in the middle looked like they participated in the making of the work. Like yeah. It was a very animated room. Mm -hmm. and um, There is a slide in here, I think, of the installation. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I'm not There's many other by you. <laughs> They're just supposed to enter your like subconscious and then affect how you leave the room when you uh -huh. go. So I mean, I guess one question people had about that, or you know, be because some people were confused by the, the by the arrangement, um, was was to me based on a kind of misunderstanding of your work, which is to say the yeah. the the feeling that your work is somewhat evacuated of um, physicality. That it really, you know, because I think, body? yeah, that there is kind yeah. of no, you know, and I think that people like because and, and your early work was so much about um, mapping, you know, it did have all of these references to kind of mapping to kind of bird's eye view to, but even the little you know, mark was a body. I always, right? always, of course, yeah. But so I want to hear you say more about, you know, respond to that. I mean, suggestion. So the body was like, in the individual marks. It was a, it, they were about individual like how this mark could affect change on this piece of paper. Like mm -hmm. if all the marks were, went this way and one mark behaved differently, you saw that mark affect how all these other marks would then behave, especially if they had to follow one another, or little rules I would set up when I was working and thinking and drawing, and then. Um, the more that this language evolved and the more that I started to work with in the architectural, you can't think about the architectural and not the body. I mean, it's not like this stuff happens, but like the, it's bodies moving through space. I mean, that's what, how we interact and work within our built environment. And, 
And it's very intentionally built in a particular way, and there's all kinds of complex narratives and histories as to why this the spaces are built the way they are and the way we interact with them and how we then impact them and shift them. And that's kind of always been a foreground of what I've been interested in and negotiating, understanding, or speculating about in my work. And I think um, eventually, as I left the architectural language behind, then the body or the disembodied parts and the way that I started to work, how they started to appear more and more in the work, I mean, they started to appear kind of just in the way that, they were always suggested mm -hmm. by, because abstraction does that. And then I started to push that even further within the blurred photograph. You would blur a photograph and it would look, look like some part of this fr uh, crucifixion to mm -hmm. you know, some, other f some other type of form. And then from within that, these other narratives kind of emerge from that landscape or from mm -hmm. that scape. And so for me, the, the, the disembodied parts and these, the, the, different, the way that those different marks engage with one another, I think of them almost like vi visual neologisms. Mm -hmm. Like the neologism comes about when the language you, that is at hand, what is it, you know, it's an utterance, it's an invention of a word, it's like the new creation of something. And when, there, when language is not enough, that's when you invent something yeah. else. And usually it's like communities and people and culture and ways of living that exist outside of what is the traditional normalized idea mm -hmm. around that. And, or what is, part, you know, what is part of the systems of power, what are parts of hegemony, all that gets challenged by, and language is one of the first ways that that's articulated and kind of concrete, you know, made concrete. And so I think that um, for me, like, you're, none of us are painting or inventing this language from, without thinking of 2,000 to 40,000 years of history of painting and making marks, or 60,000 goes mm -hmm. back. And so there's all of that history that we're working within, but all of those parts, so a particular arc thing can look like a Hammond's handprint, but can look like a 5,000 year old cave print. Mm -hmm. And then can then, can, in addition to that, can move into another, um, you know, a Phil Gustin nose mm -hmm. to a really specific kind of bacon torn body part. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. And how do you take those parts of a, of a mark that we associate and understand visually as being that? and then be able to like redo it with my mark and that right. becomes this very other, like how does that pierce and invent then this other space of thinking through, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm thinking of the title, uh, one of your titles for one of the more recent paintings, um, which is Flow Me Law after NS, which is a reference to Anina Simone song. And Flow Me Law is the entire, yeah. those are the lyrics. Yeah. And it is this kind of, you know, invention of a new system of, utterance and understanding because yeah. and they, what it's the story is really carried along in the song by tone you know by voice by, by, by voice screaming, by, by sound. melody by all the you know the grain of the voice etc but it's fully abstract fully abstract but yet full of meaning i mean but yes. also of course full of but meaning that's as what, abstraction but abstraction is. only yeah. is yeah. which is right. which is really you know when we talk, and, and that room you know you talk about abstraction and representational thing and there are so many elements. Like if you look at Poussin, Poussin is one of the most like rigorously representational painters, but one of the most abstract painters at mm -hmm. the same time. And the way that color and shape work in Poussin can't be ignored as the most flat kind of rendition of space in a particular way, mm -hmm. as well as being one of the most. And the same you could say about um, David Hammond's or when Henry Taylor's paintings, yeah. like if you're thinking about the, and I think at the same time when you're looking at my abstract paintings in that room, there are ways, there are no way, that you cannot avoid pulling out the different body parts and the kind of violence that is that occurs in those as well as this kind of, um, the jokes and the possibility of something else that sure. emerges from within yeah. them. I mean, sometimes to me, they're they're kind of like lacerations on the picture plane. Sometimes it's suturing together. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's like mascara, brushwork. I mean, there's so many. I think your mark making is so you have such a varied vocabulary for it. You know, the the references kind of accrue. You know, yeah. they accrue and they accrue. But I want to talk to you a little bit about texture. Or, or really, or but just to add, okay. I don't think, and I think this is really important that you have to know that history to really respond viscerally mm -hmm. to the painting. So I don't think that you have to understand the narrative and the, mm -hmm. and the passion of Saint Matthew or in the like martyrdom of Saint Matthew, the Caravaggio painting, to really be moved by that painting. And I think that's something that's really important to understand also in terms of how the because the intention of these paintings is not what's essential. It's how the paintings live and participate and affect 
the human being that engages them and encounters them and participates with them mm -hmm. or the tree or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. that there is this engagement that happens that is informed by your, your experience. Like we are all beings within a very visual, um, you know, symbolic world. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. exist in this, in the, within these semiotics. Like it's part of what, how we engage and understand mm -hmm. who we are and what we are. And so these aren't something that exists outside of that, but they're very much informed by very particular things, but they also have this, have invent something else. There's mm -hmm. this other kind of leveling place. And I don't like to think of the world universal because that's not what I'm talking about because it's very, these are made specifically from a very particular cultural Place, but at the same time, I think that. But would you would you use the word beauty? I think sometimes. I think mm -hmm. they're not. I think there's some ones that are not mm -hmm. very beautiful at all. Mm -hmm. I think I'm more interested in in the kind of visceral kind of shift that happens when you experience a work mm -hmm. and it changes how like and the, and I think part of it is also the dis is the disorientation. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big part of the effect of these is feeling like you str the struggle to understand in a way. You know, and then yeah. the abandon when you realize that that understanding will never quite come. You know, yeah, and, and I think that giving that, yourself you, over to the field, you know, to the field of the painting. Yeah, and I think that you have like there's there will be moments where you find moments of yourself, and you will every human being I've spoken to who looks at the, these paintings has will see different things, mm -hmm. and sometimes they see things that I see, and sometimes they see things that I've never seen. But there's usually this this aspect of uh, something if, and that changes. And, but they're time-based. Like if you look at a painting for one minute, you don't see the painting. If you look at a film for one minute, you know you haven't seen the film because you know you have to go from the beginning to the end of the film. Mm -hmm. And the painting, you don't have that time limit. So we're not like you have to look at this painting for 10 minutes, but you can't really see a painting in one minute or two minutes or three minutes. They're yeah. time-based experiences, and through the experience of looking at them, they change, and you change mm -hmm. like in that experience. Can I say something to go back to tech? Because I want to talk, press you, or not press you, but yeah, go ahead. Elaborate. I want you to be. I want you to elaborate <laughs> more about texture, especially of the in these recent works, because I think part of what is um, so interesting about them and also in a way challenging is their smoothness you know the kind of super the, the play with flatness because mm. it's very hard to you can't this is such a distortion obviously to see these slides they're very 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 smooth and the space that they seem to suggest is very shallow you know yeah. I mean there is there is um, there is a sense of kind of like depth obviously but in terms of the actual like feeling of um, tactility, they're, they've been buffed, they've, they, you know, yeah. they've been sanded. I yeah. mean, you work really hard, actually, yeah. to get that a uh, marksless surface. Yeah. And I think in some of the earlier works, texture was a way, you know, the variegation of texture was a way in, kind of, like your eye would catch on something and that would help you linger and that would help you um, distinguish between different kind of pressures of the, you know, of how yeah. you were, of, of the kind of l the labor that goes into these. And now that labor is somewhat mysterious. It's, yeah, because of because, the lack, because of the part, smoothness. But I think of it uh, all as a simulacra, right? Like it is this thing that is, this you know, your the, the the kind of experience with the painting is that it's this image that's on this rectangle. If it's an enormous rectangle like the paintings here at the museum, or if they're smaller, you know, you're there's this you're you're this individual looking at this thing, whether it's as big as you or you know small, and in that there's this projection of something, but there's also this searching and mining for something visually, and that it's not directing you in mm -hmm. terms of what it is. I mean, it used to more when you, you could say, "Here's a window," and I know that's a door, and I know that's a walk pass, passage way. But when the paintings don't have that, they become these kind, and they and and the internal space of the painting spatially is blurred. They become this haze and... There's a haze. You can't really negotiate space. You mm -hmm. negotiate depth. You can see that things fall into one another, come out mm -hmm. from one another. It feels sometimes like something's emerging, like a spectral kind of emergence is taking place, or you're witnessed something, or you've just lost something. But it is this, this, this kind of um, very simulacrum kind of like space of like this, this... Like I think of it as the way you can almost like Fred Moten one time talked about mayonnaise, you know, like mayonnaise mm -hmm. is this kind of, it's an aioli, it's like between a liquid and a, and a solid. It's this kind of in between mm -hmm. weird like state sure. that, that is sublimely like 
you yeah. can't, it's yeah, intangible. It's, uh, there's an, uh, un, there's un, an ungency or yeah. something, it's, you know? And you, yeah. It's something like something existing. Yeah. So in a way, I feel like when I'm looking at them, because you've worked, because just to emphasize that you have worked, you have labored hard to make them, to, to erase the traces of the labor, you know, in some ways. And also the use of, so it looks like, so it's like you're seeing in, you're seeing it and you're seeing into it. And it's just very, there's a sense of dislocation or uncertainty about how deep it really goes. Yeah. The, meaning the painting itself. But that uncertainty and dislocation is what I'm like. Those, those that, the, that, like, I'm interested in the aesthetics of that. Sure. Like, yeah. That's this. That's that. And the and the more I think the earlier paintings, when I was really interested in trying to negotiate a very different picture. So 1999, 2000, we were living in a really, really different world before 9/11. Before like the end of all like American, uh, what is it? D possibility of like. Um, it's kind of positive global, mm -hmm. um, global, globalized kind of futurity. Like that shifted post 9/11, and that cut a different American projection of how think how world dynamics evolved from that point as this country in this in this a, a, in its role as a superpower. And I think that, like, what I was interested in then about this connectivity and what was happening in this kind of mm -hmm. euphoric kind of you know. A different per perspective of what was being projected or speculated that shifted after mm -hmm. after 2001 and i think and i think you know like what then what has happened now post the last you know a couple of years we've seen a very very different shift mm -hmm. of something else and um and I think you know globalization and many other things have led into this situation. But I think that what I'm interested in negotiating is that it is that visceral space mm -hmm. of 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 that uncertainty yeah. and like how do we negotiate? What are the um, aesthetics of uncertainty? But what are also the ethics inside of the aesthetics of uncertainty? Well, I think it's also really crucial that you um, your use of the airbrush. Yeah. You know, and which is a really like it's a pretty that's a really classed. Um, material. material. It's raced and gendered as all materials are, but I mean, it's super, you know, I, I'd love to hear you. Well, for me, it's technically the best way to copy the photograph in paint to make it look like the blurred photograph. Mm -hmm. um, we were, I was outputting the photographs first with digital, with uh, inkjet, really high-end high, high -end inkjet printers, and the blur didn't quite have the same, <laughs> like, when it really works, then the blur, the, fo the camera can't focus properly on the painting. You have to put a piece of tape there, focus on the tape to be able to take the photograph because mm -hmm. digital cameras can't figure out what to focus on with the marks and with the blur. That, that's that super interesting. Yes. That's fascinating. Yeah. Right. That's like, and, and the eye does that in a very mm -hmm. different way, but we, we're negotiating that space and these other type of ghosts come through. So like, in early photography, when you when you had you know and you, you know even the what's her name the woman who contributed to the um, um, invention of the double helix or like the not invention but the kind of um, what was her name DNA. what was her name Rose Frank? yeah was that yeah DNA. yeah DNA Rose with Frank. with the double helix she was the one who f who did the photographs the X rays right so when she did that that was this uh, that at that moment too you had this really kind of interesting even earlier than that, interesting negotiation with photography. And what f what else could be what else could be realized about what we didn't understand mm -hmm. sense-wise? And it wasn't just in the microscopic level with the x-rays, but also in terms of these ideas of the photography of the occult and, this, mm -hmm. and the spirit and the kind of the, could you catch what was happening at, with somebody's aura or with the spirit yeah. coming out of them? And what was left over? What were the ghosts that were participating? There was all these efforts at trying to actually capture right. that. It, I mean, usually it was, it was what was interesting plays with light and time and space. And there was no real science behind it. She went somewhere else. And, but this, this form of photography didn't. But I was really interested in what, those photographs are beautiful and mm -hmm. they, there's something about socially what's going on and then what that brings up in terms of its mining of our collective history and the violence of that mm. collective history and what's embedded in that colonial sublime that I'm super interested in that comes up in the blurs. Well, and maybe, and maybe it's not just mayonnaise, you know, but maybe it's like ectoplasm. Yeah. You know, like there is some, and it is maybe like the veil between the known and the unknown or something. But there's this piercing of, like, uh -huh. so in the projection of, 
inventing something, there's a peer, there's these holes within these layers, and there are these gaps through every form of language, whether writers have a lot of space, because you invent languages, you invent characters, then you push the form of writing into, and there's, in terms of the art history, there have been these ideas around abstraction that particular forms of abstraction have been invented, and then the, the, the conversation mm -hmm. has been closed on what that has done, which is the opposite of what is re what really exists in the world. I mean, many of those forms of abstraction in that history, MoMA just put out a great book right now that I highly recommend to anyone who has it, doesn't have it, called Among Others. And it's uh, Darby English wrote a, an enormous text at the beginning of this book, which talks about MoMA's history and, and with blackness since 1929 until now. And Mabel Wilson has another really great text mm -hmm. in that book about um, architecture. A much shorter text and much more manageable to read it, but his text is super exacting and goes into the minutia of this history mm -hmm. from 1929 until now. And and I think the rehang of MoMA, I haven't seen it, mm -hmm. really is trying to deal with this yeah. history. Mm -hmm. But I think as as, as, a, as someone who's painting and, and working within that language and that history and have has I've always been immensely inspired and moved by that language, but I've also also felt a certain there's been these spaces and huge gaps in what that could be. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, its opacity was what drew, mm -hmm. drew me to it, but it's also its capability and, and possibility mm -hmm. also is what drew me to it. And so there's something super important in finding those gaps and, and fissures in, within mm -hmm. our cultural language and history and possibilities, and then use those as possible vectors to project for something else, for a different type of futurity and mm -hmm. different type of possibility. Is something like where you might be in a reinstalled MoMA important to you? Like, is that, I mean, because I texted you once from inside the gallery at the Dartmouth, the Hood Museum in Dartmouth, where they have really beautiful installation in their African galleries, and you are in the African galleries. You're not in the American galleries. And it looks great. It looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought it was a really, I thought it was a great, uh, so, you know, a really interesting cur curatorial choice that really worked. Yeah. And made, it made a lot of sense with the other things that were hung there. Ella, well, Ella that included Ella et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, is this something that I, I'm just curious, you know, this is, there's a lot of attention being paid now to. Yeah. I mean, I think MoMA's who, really. Who you're next to. In I these, haven't seen it. Yeah. I've seen some photos. Well, just opened like two days ago. So you've been <laughs> in LA. Yeah. They, they, they have several paintings, but the painting that they have. The one that they choose to include right now is the painting that I made in 2003, and it was a very different picture, and it was looking at that moment. It was it's mm -hmm. it's it's in the galleries looking at that moment from the early 90s into the mid 2000s, and it was this moment of interconnectivity. I mean, when I was in grad school, email was just beginning. That's how like I mean yeah. that was 1996. So it's like it, it's everybody knows this, but when and you, you would really have to maybe like about, go to a special lab. Yeah, I mean it's like, just it's just like it, it just. Even in yeah. the, when I took those photographs that become part of that painting, I went to the top of this tower in, in Istanbul and took pictures all the way around of the city, and I painted all the rooftops that I could mm -hmm. locate in the photographs that became the ground of that painting. But those, I mean, you could get a zillion more rooftops now with cameras. Mm -hmm. It's like very, very different technology and time and space. And, um, and what happens in those paintings and in that time, I, I'm curious to see how that, but no, I don't, I actually, to tell you the truth, I don't spend that much time thinking yeah, about how e the work is placed or, you know, or under, or I get, that that becomes somewhat limiting and mm -hmm. I'm sorry you guys it's, keep getting keeps, stuck yeah. on the hat. It's not a bad thing to, to keep th contemplating, for sure. Uh, so, but the long and the short of it is you're pleasantly surprised when it makes, when it's You know, usually I look at old not. paintings and I have like a lot of, it's 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 more of a mining of myself, like when I'm. But I'm curious to see it. I mean, uh huh. I mean, here's a question, I guess, which is, I mean, a mid-career retrospective. That's a major moment, not only for you to take stock of your own um, work and career, but sort of for the world also to kind of put you in the proper histories, you know, to kind of reckon with the legacy, you know, a legacy yeah. that has is now somewhat well established. Um, do you feel that the narratives that have been generated around your work, you know, how do you, I mean, do, first of all, do you track them? Do you feel like, or do you feel like the story, real, the real story has yet to be told? I know that Fred Moten, for example, contributed to this catalog. I'm really excited to read yeah, that. Yeah, I don't think the, I think that there's, um, The way that writers or critics or the art world wants to compartmentalize and understand 
th there's a lot of problems in the, in how that happens, mm -hmm. and um, and a lot of it, like the art world's going through seismic shifts and changes, and part of it is because it's so monetized, mm -hmm. but part of it's because it's so globalized. And so you have many more participants and much more money in that. Mm -hmm. And what that, I mean, art and money have always been, like that's nothing new. I mean, this is from pre-colonial times. Like it took resources to invent. I mean, from early, early, you know, that's what happened. And so I don't, like, that's, that's a different whole con conversation. That's a super rich and interesting conversation. But what I think, what you see happening in the, wor in, in the art world is, Although you have many, many worlds and you have many, many different types of pra practitioners and makers and participants in that. And there's this, there's a way of consuming and understanding and kind of um, encapsulating mm -hmm. and packaging somebody that is is a way for, for the amount of information that people are literally digesting daily. Mm -hmm. It's a way to do that. And I think mm -hmm. you can't do that with 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 works of art. I mean, you can't do that with one Caravaggio painting, let alone mm -hmm. like a whole artist and all their careers. Like they're, it's impossible to try and like tie, tie it up so neatly. Mm -hmm. And so it, so that's kind of the interesting long game. Like how wrong do, do people get that? <laughs> you know, right. like, well, I feel like they're, I mean, you're central. Everyone acknowledges that you're central to these very important interesting and complicated conversations around black abstraction. You know, I think it's been a little less, um, which overlap with feminist abstraction and do overlap also with queer abstraction, but those latter two categories have been somewhat less drawn out. Right. Yeah, like to- Totally. But I think yeah, that's also you know, because this, there haven't point. been people writing about mm -hmm. that in the same way mm -hmm. and that it took certain people who made those who, to say that. Mm -hmm. Whereas I actually think that um, in terms of the black radical tradition, abstraction's always been core. Mm -hmm. Has that been something that's been talked about in terms of art history and in terms of the courses? Not until recently. Mm -hmm. um, many of those artists were living in poverty or without, without, even though they had recognition or were major contributors to movements and time. I mean, Ninth Street Women is a great mm -hmm. example of heroic women, important, who invented and participated in the construction of a huge part of our history and visual history, like abstract expressionism. They invented this as a word, as a language, as a form, and have been erased from that in terms of the canons. Mm -hmm. Like, And so I think you're seeing a redressing of that history and a mining of that history and a but it's not as if we haven't been participating and making and inventing and working through that. So I think in the big, big, big picture, mm -hmm. a, a different narrative will emerge. Mm -hmm. But I hope that I don't even understand that. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. As well about my own work. Sure. It, because even looking... Wouldn't it be kind of boring if you felt like you yeah, got like everything even, you were doing? If yeah. you knew everything you were doing? Totally. And looking back at what I've, I made in the early 90s or the mid-90s, it's so it's so instructive. Like it's been mm -hmm. so instructive to put this together because it made me. It it, it shows you how much like how it, it's kind of another example of how it, how intu the intuitive sense knows so much and like understands and and it's about like actually not limiting that creative potential mm -hmm. in in the individual rather than kind of trying to limit that further. Mm. And and in essence, that's like liberation. That's like you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And that's like something else about where art can go, but. Hmm. Like to me, that's something that's crucial, and I think that's what Nina, Nina Simone is looking for in that song. Totally. Well, I think this is a good moment because we've been talking for about an hour to maybe open it up. I know there's a lot of people in this room who are really excited that you're here and probably have questions. Oh boy, right away! Yes, please. Test, 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 test. Get close. Okay, yeah. Um, I was totally like noticing the images in the back, and they're so like they're totally like vivid and like awesome. But um, I don't know when you take like something really charged, you know, and also kind of boil it down to like shape, space, and time, um, and then it's put in a place like a museum or something. Do you ever fear of how they're digested, or that there's something about it that becomes palatable or are you hoping that the violence is also digested when people are looking at it but i think you live in violence we live in violence daily and i don't think i mean these images that i'm showing are examples of media showing that violence but it's not it's not separate from the daily experience of that 
So I don't, like as a creative like th maker, I'm working in a negotiation of that constantly. And I think that that's like what informs how I'm, th the, this is a, is a way to like illustrate part of this archive that, it, that is, is part of our social time in a way. But that's not, and that's part of this, that, this building, like this room, the history of this room is part of that and part of that history and that part of what informs how I think through and make from that. So I don't ever think of making as something about boiling anything down. Like I think that that's like, that's like when you're cooking food, you know, when you're boiling down like ingredients to make and, and, and morph those into something else. But I actually think like this is about like a negotiation through visual language and visual experience and, and then felt physical feelings and experiences and ideas of who one is and trying to make sense of that into inventing a different kind of image. And for me, I'm in, interested in the history of the museum and that space for negotiating and presenting a different narrative and a different kind of image in that space. Do you know what I mean? That's okay, it's good that it's like. <laughs> uh, this is really amazing to hear your, um, your, your words and I, you're just, uh, your forms, and um, as an artist, I was really lucky growing up to um, visit some of your early work and realizing that it was like sound, and I was standing in front of your pieces, there were two in a room, and it felt like sound was collecting, as opposed to, even though I was seeing something so visual, it actually was pointing to something beyond the visual, mm. and um, I'm wondering, as an artist who works with phenomena in that way, um, what was it like to work in that church in Harlem where you kind of had more space maybe than usual? And what inspires you in terms of sound and the relationship to your work? So. Great, I love that you had that experience. I think of the paintings, I think they're very sonic experiences as well, and some way more than others. And part of the sonic experience of the blurred paintings, I think, is about this kind of like, the way sound almost operates underwater, where you can't really figure out what that is that you're listening to or what, what register it is, as opposed to like a really staccato beat. But um, for me, the church was an incredible, incredible experience. But also, it's the strangest type of building to work in, because everything in that building is like directed to commit to like address to to make you address yourself and kind of go into yourself. Mm -hmm. So while it feels like this super expansive space, it absolutely isn't in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And as much light as I had coming in, the stained glass was gone, and they had tra it was it, it felt very much like at, when I was done after a while working there, I was happy to be in a different space that had a view that I could see something else because. It is architecturally really invented and, and intended to direct yourself into yourself. And it's, a, it's even though it's enormous. So it has this like metaphoric idea of like, mm -hmm. and I think really interestingly, like um, having, when I was in the church, I also went to some caves in Spain. And it is, it, and I knew this before from having experienced it, but it was so uncanny to feel that experience again in mm -hmm. these caves in um, Santander. Spain that, that you feel in the church when you really spend a, a you know a, I don't go to ch I didn't go to church as often as I spent that year working in that space. But also I, I should say you know I had Jason Moran coming there regularly serenading me from the balcony <laughs> while I worked. I mean, <laughs> I wanted to know about the performance aspect of your work. I saw. Uh, in the images, it looked as if there was a performance, but also how you uh, relate to performance in your work. It's a good question. So I think of the paintings as these markers of performance and a performative kind of space. They're in, they're in that. that. That's how, like, it's you can't stand in front of them and experience them without thinking of how they were made and how fast some marks are made or how slow or how big those marks are. Or So the trace of the body and the jet and the movement of that is apparent. In the same way when you have Richard Serra tearing lead, you've, there's no way to not feel that when you're experiencing those pieces. Um, so there is that, the remnant of that. And they're performative in terms of in the way performance kind of invents anew as it occurs. And 
and v that is very different when you experience that or when you experience a performance of sound than when you actually have a recording of it and you replay it. And then it's, but it's ephemeral, it goes away. It's like you hear it and then all you ha can do is kind of remember it, but it's never the same as the experience of. So there's this kind of, the residual of that that keeps happening in cycles when I think in front of the paintings for me. And, but I've also been super interested in in working with performance artists and um, we, I've had different type of performance events in front of the paintings, whether it was the big painting that I made for Miro for downtown Manhattan, um, at the Goldman Sachs building on 200 West Street. When I had that in the Berlin, uh, Berlin studio, we had an opera that was performed in front of that painting with a composer who worked with me that he wrote the score based off of the painting. Jason Moran worked mm -hmm. with me for the Howell paintings that are here, and hopefully one day that piece will come and he will perform that here in San Francisco. He performed that in the church with the paintings. Um, with, this re with the show now at, down at the Los Angeles County Museum, we have like um, a many different artists who are coming to then do something within the paintings. And I'm always interested in how the painting into engages within that, that form of making. Because performance art offers a very, I mean, I'm curious actually, mm -hmm. if you can actually speak about your show that you're curating in Sao Paulo on mm -hmm. dancing. Mm -hmm. and that because yeah. that's also has this interesting relation to I think what's afforded in aesthetics and politics in, in terms of yeah I mean one we're, I mean something that we're deeply concerned about is not treating paintings like backdrops for moving bodies you yeah. know how to activate yeah. paintings in their own on their own terms yes. as um, maybe crystallizing something about a dancerly language so I'm curating this show that will open in June that in involves a lot of Latin American kinetic art uh, especially by women where you know the sculpture is dancing or that's the right. proposition that we're engaging with or the, the painting itself is the dancerly form right. you know at stake so that it doesn't just become so kind of theatrical the theatrical yeah. and so when I saw this performance with Ralph Lemon and um, Oakley and who else it was at the Whitney um, there's, I'm forgetting two other artists, but it was this amazing performance that took place inside one of his exhibitions. And when, while they were doing this, what was occurring in their performance, I thought of it was the space in the paintings. Mm -hmm. And that's when I wanted that to be part of this conversation, not necessarily in the paintings, mm -hmm. but as this context to articulate. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was, it was kind of amazingly moving mm -hmm. to have that experience where you actually see this thing happening in space that feels like in this, what you call the very thin membrane of mm -hmm. the paintings. Mm -hmm. I see other hands. Um, I find your work very musical and dynamic. And I'm just wondering if you could speak at all of musicians or artists who have informed your work or your aesthetic. <laughs> when you were studying in school? Well, I look, I've looked at work my whole life and I look really seriously at, at work. I, I travel to look at paintings and uh, uh, certain artworks. I have, so I've been informed by an enormous number of artists. I mean, there are certain artists whose work was important to me when I was studying. I can think of Matt Mulliken because of his kind of negotiation of trying to deal with world building and the individual and negotiating like meaning from that. Mm -hmm. I think of Alan McCollum as another artist who, who was making at that time. Um, and then there were... These are such surprising I know. <laughs> touchstones for you. It's wonderful to hear, you know, how expansive your influences <laughs> have been. You know, Matt Mulligan, someone who deals with a kind of channeling almost... You know? But also this concept of like the individual in this kind of yeah. society of the spectacle, mm -hmm. like and um, and Alan McCollum really an obdurate, almost a refusal, refusal. to picture, you right. know, like right. like a negation. But to me, they were but, in but then because it's so serial, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 this kind proliferation of, of the negation that turns into a, a yeah. positive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then musically, I've listened to. I'm a, I'm a child of hip hop. I grew up with rap as like, I mean. I was very young when that music started. That was the music that informed me from early, they, having grown up in Michigan, being like informed early of that, like new wave and early punk, late punk. And I was, so all of this informed me, you know, drum and bass and electronic music. And so I became very jazz. I became like, all of this became part of what informs how I think and work. And I mean, it's, a, that's why there's so many images. I think that's like what I chose, tried to, give you like a little bit of a, 
a, a way in. When you do these large paintings, you know, you have like Ferguson and Cairo, you sort of have the subject and things like that. But when you go to do, doing something small, how do you sort of get away from all this multi sort of dimensional thing to a smaller work? And what do you, how do you kind of switch your mind and what makes you make the smaller works? So the, the smaller works are never small versions of the big works, and they're never parts of the big works. They're almost their own investigations. If it's a drawing or, or an etching, the way that I approach that is really different. I mean, all the work started in etching when I was in school. And then, um, and then I start, like, there's always this investigation. And really, like, I, what I said when I speak before I think, like, that's really a big part of trying to make. Like, it's like you make the mark before you try to process what it is. And there's... Many that you don't, you edit and you, you know, don't work. Or, but there's usually these really interesting lessons that take place in that. And so for me, this whether I mean, I make the work based like based on what I'm trying to think about and engage with. And and so if it, I don't make a painting the scale of Cairo anymore, but when I did that, it was for a particular investigation. And when I'm working on small drawings, it's usually to like push something in mark making or. When I'm working on monotypes, that's to push something else and try to do something in this other slippery space. I think it's like the way writers work with short stories, and small pieces, and then essays and novels. They're very different projects that take different amounts of time and that you think through things very differently. Mm -hmm. Or journals. Yo. Hello. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier um, when you were talking about putting together the retrospective, the um, erratic connections between the different works. And we've talked a lot about kind of like the things that have influenced you or we've been watching a quite erratic, um, <laughs> connected slideshow. And I was wondering what for you is like the content of those connections between the works themselves or are you a, the thing like the node that connects all of it? And uh, yeah, I was just curious about both that phrase and kind of when you think through putting together a retrospective, how you think about the relationships between the different artworks themselves. Well, that's that really forced um, project in a way. Like you, you are these different individuals through, co through when you're in college or when you're in graduate school or when you're in whatever, as you move through life in the world. And, and there are really erratic changes that happen in how you reinvent in yourself and think of yourself and understand yourself and negotiate that. And I think that, um, I think those kinds of things happen in the invention of these images and the invention of making paintings. And so I think when you ask a novelist, how are you going to tie together 10 books? Like, if you talk to Philip Roth, there are certain investigations that Philip or Toni Morrison was really committed to. And those are essential. Like there, But you can't boil all her books down to, to use your language, all her work down to just that. Because each of those books, or Colson Whitehead, they're mm -hmm. so different. Jasmine Ward, they're like these amazing, they're individual experiences that become, that are really, you know, when you think about the intuitionist and you think about um, what's this underground Railroad. Book? Yeah, the Underground Railroad, and even his newest book, The Nickel Boys. Mm -hmm. Like those are such hugely different mm -hmm. works, and invest. And but there's this, the, the, there's this, you know. So I don't know. Like it's hard for me to give d such clear language to that because then you give put these intense limits on what's possible in terms of what can what really is underneath that, you know. Thank you for uh, the wonderful images in this presentation. Uh, the marks uh, seem like you've put them down and you knew that mark was going to stay. Are there, no? No. no. Like, is there... Of every mark that stays, there's about 40 that disappear. So are you sketching or working no. in the painting or is there any pre? No, no, it happens in real time. That's right. the performative side, right? Like so. But when I put a mark down, if that mark looks too self-conscious, too whatever, too derivative, whatever, like there's this constant editing constantly happening. So I can put any mark down with anything. Airbrush, spray paint, paint, my hand, a towel, and I can take it away pretty quickly. And that happens for most of the marks that go down. Thank you. 
Maybe one That's or now, two more. Also, by the way, not when I was younger, every mark stayed. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Do we? I see one a hand there. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a question as it relates to intuition. Um, so much of intuition has to do with feeling, feeling one's way through process. And I was wondering, we, you, you talked a lot about uncertainty and um, sort of dislocation, but are there, do you, what are some of the spectrums of feelings that you experience as you're making? How would you describe your, your, your feeling space? I don't think of intuition as feeling. Like only, like I think that's an aspect or a part of it. But it's if that I think of intuition as a sense. So if you think of taste as a sense, you can say a lemon tastes sour, and to somebody else, you know, there are these different levels of what that taste can be in these different resonances. So I don't think of it, I think of intuition as a way of understanding and processing and under, negotiating and researching and processing language and. Um, sampling, and I think of it as many, of operating on many different levels. But what I think happens intuitively is that you, you, there's a, there's an aspect of knowledge and and understanding that we, that we don't ha that doesn't work mm -hmm. in the front of our of our minds, where where really interesting connections and interesting dynamics occur. And I think that that's something that we don't really have a full understanding of, but it's it's like super valuable and crucial and important into making and thinking and writing and researching and uh, science and everything. Like, I just think it's not really spoken about. I mean, I think it is actually, but it's not, I mean, it's kind of categorized or we have this very limited understanding of what that is. But when I speak about working intuitively, it's a very informed way of working, but it's about accessing a space. Maria Montessori called it the zone. Athletes call it something else. Mm -hmm. When they're in the space where the tennis ball really slows down or whatever, or whatever it's called, and becomes really big, or whatever it is. Different, different people engage in that very differently. Musicians and how their fingers move. There's a way that, there's a sensibility and knowledge of how to do something that is not something that you can actually, um, that we can quantify and speak about rationally in the same way that we can many other things. And I think that's what, I, when I talk about working intuitively, I'm talking about that sense. Maybe one more question. If there is one, or not. OK, one more. I have a hand here. Uh, first of all, it's thank you for your work and the ways in which you're putting language to intuition and abstraction. I think I really appreciate. Um, just in terms of, I hear it seems a lot of people are getting this uh, sonic experience or relationship to music, and you said you are like to listen to stuff while you work. And I was just curious if you had any sort of like um, formalities about what you listen to or if you like listen to something continuously, if that's like producing a kind of like energy or environment for you or, yeah, if you ever find any boundaries yeah. around that. Sometimes. I think like, I have to say, I listen to things so differently now with, with like title or with, you know, being able to stream music in a very, and I still have a record player in the studio, and that came back into the studio more recently. I only usually had that at home, but I, and then it depends. Like if I'm, if, if other people are working in my studio, then I'm, then I use my headphones and I'm not listening to things in an ambient atmosphere. It's very different. Um, where I would listen to music really loud on speakers, and then when you have, when you like put headphones on, you move into this other space. Um, so it really, really depends. There's really no rule about how, it, usually the one thing is I start with the news in the morning and I'm usually in that space. If I'm really lost in a book, I might go into that. It really depends on the day and what I'm doing. There are times where I need to find where I'm becoming too self-conscious or something and then I do look for ways to like break that and it's usually by trying to find something else to listen to and that's when I usually try to find a new form of sound or I go back to particular music that I know kind of takes me elsewhere Thank you all for coming, and thank you especially to Julie for coming all the way from installing. Thank you for coming. <laughs>